All right. Um, I believe we're on day 87. Uh, it's uh, January 1st. It's the night of January 1st. And uh, let's start with um, for the sit rep for today, for the Gaza War sit rep for today. Let's start with the Aria, A A R Y G E A Y, uh, R E G J goes by Aria. Uh, and let's take a look at his daily summary of all of the operations uh, today. Big summary of all resistance operations today, January 1st, against U.S. Israeli forces. Uh, Qassam Brigades, that's Hamas's armed wing, seized a Zionist quadcopter drone during its intelligence mission in Beit Hanoud, north of Gaza, set up a well-planned ambush for a special Zionist force or special forces in one of the buildings facing military vehicles in the Burej camp, ambushed with gunfire and shells, causing casualties, safely withdrawing afterwards detonated a minefield targeting uh, Israeli special forces on the Khalil military site east of the Tufa neighborhood in Gaza, confirmed killing of 15 soldiers. That's a major uh, casualty event for the Israeli military. Um, partially destroyed two Merkava tanks and five military vehicles in various combat zones. Uh, two cases of detonating a booby-trapped tunnel entrance, causing casualties, one in Tufa and the other in Qarara area north of Khan Yunis, uh, and a third one uh, in Qarara again. Targeted a military vehicle gathering in Tufa, sniper attack on an Israeli soldier in Borej, three soldiers uh, attacked with explosives in Khan Yunis, targeted IO, Israeli forces in Tufa with rocket barrages, targeted special forces in uh, with a with a thermobaric grenade causing causing casualties. Soraya Al Quds uh, partially destroyed an APC, two vehicles, uh, one Merkava tank, and two military D nine bulldozers, and then many others, including the targeting of an Israeli helicopter with a anti aircraft missile in Al Shujaiya, directly hitting it. Um, many shelling, many clashes reported by various others um, here. So another very, very active day with many different attacks and rather severe Israeli uh, casualties. Now, there there was a report that Israelis are withdrawing uh, several of their units from Gaza ahead of re... I mean, a rotation. So ahead of um, rest and R and R and and rotating new units in, and they've also mentioned that they're considering moving to a different phase from high intensity to lower intensity, presumably uh, less uh, so fewer soldiers driving around in tanks, uh, presenting targets to um, to Palestinian resistance. Uh, infantry fighters and more i believe the idea was some kind of buffer zone trying to maintain some kind of buffer zone around so maybe more like uh constricting the territory from the outside as opposed to going in and, and kind of wandering around on these patrols which seem to be uh where they continuously get hit um i'm not sure how that will work um i'm not sure exactly what they have in mind Presumably, they want to and do some kind of envelope and then shell, as well as an air the normal continual air force pounding which they've been doing. So, not sure how different that'll be. Except they'll, the idea is probably that they're trying to keep up the attacks on especially the civilian population without endangering their own military vehicles and soldiers. That's a standard principle that they always try to fulfill, whether they'll be able to do it or not. I guess we'll see whether they'll even try to do it or not. I guess we'll see. They've withdrawn some of their soldiers already and presumably rotated others in, or maybe they can at some point rotate others in. Um, as far as on the ground... Besides this active day of attacks and this news that they've withdrawn, 
you've probably seen news from Yemen. You've seen that the United States attacked some Yemeni uh, speedboats from Ansarullah, killed 10 Yemeni sailors. Uh, Yemen said they'll be holding uh, the U.S. accountable, so that's uh, scary. We've got more Iranian ships entering the Red Sea, so lots of signs of escalation at the beginning of 2024 there, and the war with Hezbollah between Israel and Hezbollah also is continuing. I'll we'll probably dive into all of those individual fronts at various points. I always also neglect Iraq and Syria, where armed groups are also fighting the Americans in both of those uh, countries as well. And we will come back to all of those. What I actually wanted to talk about today was October 7th, the claims of mass rape, specifically that Hamas committed mass sexual violence on October 7th. And Others have dealt with that. I have referred to them before, the gray zone, the electronic intifada being the main two. Uh, Propaganda and Co. has made a video using the reporting from these two. Oh, Mondo Weiss as well, from these organizations. I, I wanted to say a couple of general things about this because Max, I'll, I'll, I'll show you Max Blumenthal's analysis of it um, because Max, what Max does as always is go into the specific granular detail of who is making these claims, how much credibility they have and why, um, what, what sources they're relying on. So he says one that it's the New York times story he refers to purports to contain several credible eyewitness testimonies. One is Raz Cohen who happens to be an Israeli special forces vet who trains Congolese soldiers. I'll come back to the Congo for various reasons in a few minutes. Cohen told NYT he witnessed a white van fill up, filled with Hamas militants pull up a mile from the Nova Music Festival, gather over a woman and gang rape her. Um, gory details, of course, here. Um, and Blumenthal notes that the story builds up over time. So the first interview, Cohen didn't say he saw this. Then he gradually starts to add vague stories. He falls off the media's ra radar. He would not be heard from for another two months. Um, at this point, they summon Cohen to give this vivid, shocking account. Um, and so he questions that. He goes through the other sources, um, uh, 24 accountant, 24 year old accountant identified as Sapir. Um, she says she saw three other women raped and terrorists carrying the seven head severed heads, but there are no independent records there. Um, the New York Times relies on a paramedic named G who claims that they saw these which Max tries to match with the list of casualties, is unable to do so. He also um, discredits G um, in detail. And then Max has a separate story about Zaka, which is another source for some of the worst claims. So what Max is doing here is going through and showing how the sources on which this edifice of mass rape is built don't actually hold up. And in fact, they are used um, as a rhetorical device to justify genocide. And um, Hamas themselves have... Um, have directly addressed the New York Times in a couple of tweets that I saw. You may have seen them uh, where they they just go through and say, first of all, these are not credible sources. These are lies. Second of all, we have um, our soldiers are disciplined and trained and they're Muslim and religious and they do not conduct these kinds of acts as a matter of course. 
and third the the raid was conceived as a lightning raid no no matter how depraved the soldiers were there was no the, the, this was a situation in which minutes counted. There was no one who was going to stop and commit these heinous acts um, in the middle of this operation that was timed and executed with all this precision. So the there's the sources, there's the plausibility of the argument. Um, maybe some of you saw I, if you haven't, the videos from November 28th, 29th of the Israeli hostages being released, you can look at their body language with their captors. Uh, you know, again, none of these are slam dunks. It is impossible to prove that something didn't happen. Uh, it's just that um, there is the Israeli military and organizations have every reason to lie about this. And there is some evidence that that's exactly what they've done. And these are secondhand accounts, thirdhand accounts, accounts of people who say they've seen videos, accounts that have follow, fallen apart under scrutiny. And all of, all of these are, again, designed to create an image and an impression and an emotion that's so horrible and horrific that it renders um, the alleged perpetrators outside of humanity, outside of empathy, outside of consideration, and justifies everything that is therefore done to them, which is murdering tens of thousands of children, um, all of the violence, all of the sexual humiliation that we've seen Israel inflicting on people in Gaza over the past three months, 87 days now. I wanted to say just a couple of other other things about this rhetorical device um, and the idea of accusing somebody uh, or a party to the to a conflict of something so horrible that you render any discussion of, about them impossible. And I, I noticed this around uh, China some years ago, the accusation that China was committing genocide in Xinjiang against the Uyghur Muslim minority. And I looked into it then, and the truth is, it, if if it had been the case, if, if China was committing genocide, the way that Israel is committing genocide against the Palestinians right now, then there would, it would overshadow anything else that they had done. If they, if they, even if they lifted 800 million people out of poverty, which they did, who would want to, how could you value that? How could you say, okay, well, on the one hand, they've lifted all these people out of poverty, but on the other hand, they've slaughtered 11,000 children in three months and brag about it on social media and make jokes about it and call them the children of darkness and um, torture their children in prisons and, and uh, cut off food and water and electricity to them. And there, those are things that Israel's doing out in the open. So even if Israel had some excellent social welfare program, it would be it would be overshadowed by genocide. The same way that um, if China were committing genocide in Xinjiang, it would overshadow the fact that they have this incredibly successful anti poverty program, or there are other things, the things that they're doing with uh, forest restoration with the three sh sh uh, shelter belt forest program or high-speed trains or infrastructures or any of the things that they're doing would be overshadowed by genocide. The, the act, the crime is so heinous that it overshadows everything. And so the crime that Hamas is accused of by Israel, which is um, mass rape as a weapon of war, that is such a heinous crime that it does render anything that they may have done that's militarily significant on October 7th, moot. We can't talk about that because it it is overshadowed by by this, this uh, mass rape um, accusation. You can't talk about anything, right? All, all you all you can you have to the conversation is over um, at that point. 
And that is precisely the point. That's precisely the reason for this accusation and the, the accusing them of the most heinous crime. Now, um, I, I don't think that the evidence is there. I think that a lot of the counter arguments from, for example, Hamas directly, from what we've seen of the hostages uh, afterwards, including the ones who hate Palestinians. One of the, you may have seen an interview with one of the returned hostages who was talking about how much she was happy when she heard of Israeli bombings and how much she um, had to hide her enthusiasm when she heard that one of her captors, her comrades was killed in one of these bombings. Um, but um, she didn't, you know, you have to listen to the whole testimony as uh, pro-Israel people would tell you to do and see whether that lines up and how that lines up with the most um, heinous crimes that Hamas is accused of uh, and whether that matches or not. Um, so I actually... I actually have extensively studied the one case that I know of where rape is used or it was used as a weapon of war. And that is in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it was when I first heard of it, it was at a lecture by a doctor um, who treats women who have uh, suffered this uh, particular type of attack, Dr. Denis Mukwege. And he was in uh, Toronto and he gave a lecture sometime in 2007 or eight. And uh, uh, he talked about this and, and I found it really shocking. I never had never heard of it before. And I found myself unsatisfied with the idea that it was, uh, um, let me, let me try to put it a different way. I wanted to understand the strategic logic of it, meaning if it was in fact a strategy of war or a weapon of war, what was the war? What were the objectives of the war? Who was using this weapon? Who was um, under attack by this weapon? And I managed to answer all of those questions, but I had to go to Congo. I went to um, Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo twice, once in 2009 and once in 2011 on kind of journalistic research trips. And I met Dr. McQuaggy both times. I went to his hospital, Pansy Hospital. And uh, there's a couple of pieces of literature um, to share with you. One, one is, you know, my article, which was an interview with uh, Dr. Mukwege from 2013, after, I guess, my second trip there, um, Healing in the Congo. It's about uh, the Pansy Hospital as an oasis in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's located in Bukavu, the capital of South Kivu. It's known as the place where women survivors of rape can go to get treatment. So um, all of this, it's a relatively short article, um, but it covers some in order to really get to the bottom of who was using rape as a weapon, I actually had to study the entire complex of wars and imperial interventions in Central Africa from independence until about 2006. And the result of all of that study, which was many years of work, was the book uh, America's Wars on Democracy in Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. So if you want all of the details about this, <coughs> there in this book. And the a, a specific study of, of rape, what Dr. McQuaggy calls rape with extreme violence is here. Rape with Extreme Violence, the New Pathology in South Kivu, Democratic Republic of Congo. He's treating survivors of the war the war um in and and these mass rape incidents he's broken down in this paper and in various interviews he's talked about the strategic goals and 
<coughs> and the way that he analyzes it is that or the way that the way that it happens basically is that it'll be a village near some strategic objective usually a mine that's remote it's not easily accessed by road or you know it's sometimes in some cases the mining the metals that are mined are actually removed by plane so there's so little access that the village is really in the middle of nowhere in the Democratic Republic of Congo on the border between Rwanda and the DRC. An armed group, and the, according to some of this data, it's really only one side of the war that uses rape as a weapon. There are two sides to this war. There are the Rwandan-backed um, groups that are called, and right now they're called M19. They've had various names. And then there are the local militias. And McQuaig is very clear. The local militias also commit rape. They rape women. Um, they take women un, um, against their will to become their wives or, or their camp. Um, you know, they sexually exploit them uh, in all kinds of terrible ways but the use of rape as a weapon this use of rape with extreme violence as a weapon is only deployed by the rwandan backed groups against congolese in villages and what they do is they kill men they rape women um possibly to you know the hypothesis being that in addition to the trauma and the um, displacement, because people just will walk out of the village and try to go to the city, leaving the, you know, leaving the countryside completely displaced, uh, completely empty, so that they can, um, so that the militias can operate and access the mines and access the miners and uh, get what they want, take what they want from the village, but also to cause a series of secondary strains on the system because the web, the survivors have to be treated. There's uh, sexually transmitted diseases that are transmitted through these rapes. Um, the other thing is this is a, an incredibly violent and absolutely horrific method. It leaves many, many, many survivors. So in fact, this is precisely what Dr. McQuaig does is he does these surgeries to um, to uh, repair um, you know to to repair those damaged uh, organs uh, to to repair basically the damage done by these attacks um, and there's a whole um, infrastructure at Pansy Hospital uh, you know uh, that that's that's there uh, for that and and other hospitals in the east as well. So uh, the reason for going into all this detail about it is when you understand the case, it's it's not just part of it is to say it's not something that just happens wherever there's war. As far as I know, I've studied a lot of wars. And as far as I know, this is the only one where there's mass uh, sexual violence as a what we think is a deliberate strategy there's no document anywhere right saying so but there's enough survivors from these attacks report there's enough injuries and patterns of injuries and data from these attacks that suggest and the, the locations of them that you can put together a sense of what the strategy is and i did read that um it was used in Rwanda as well, this type of violence, but that's not a different conflict. Actually, it's the same one. Um, if you read my book or if you study that conflict, you understand the Rwandan war um, from 1994 continued into the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo throughout the 90s and into the early 2000s. And that's it's not a different war. And in fact, it's the same people 
And those same people were also the personnel in some, several important big wars in Uganda in the 1980s. So again, you need to, and Burundi, so you need to understand Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, Democratic Republic of Congo as all a structure of wars. And that's where this, and studying that over decades is what I did and what I had to do because I wanted to understand this one horrific strategy or weapon of war, which I had heard about in a lecture, I don't know, 20, 15 years ago. So it's not something that just happens. It is something that evolved in this one area where we know a lot about it. It evolved over time in a very genocidal war where there are remote areas that are completely inaccessible where if you're if a armed group comes into town you have nowhere to go and they could be there for a long time before anybody arrives um to that that wants to fight them and the way that these rural wars go where there's an insurgency or a counterinsurgency is like this. And this is true of Colombia um, and other guerrilla wars or, or rural wars that I have studied where the insurgents will come and they'll occupy a village for a long time. And then the state forces will come or the M19 or the Rwandan backed forces will come and the guerrillas will leave or the insurgents will leave, the counterinsurgents will come and they'll punish the civilian population for having harbored the guerrillas and vice versa. So you get this, that's why you get this cycle of violence where you get these villagers that are completely exhausted of atrocities committed by both sides because the guerrillas are coming through and the insurgents are coming through, the counterinsurgents are coming through and they're both committing reprisals against the village um, for having trying to root out the supporters of the other side. So there's a lot of that going on in the rural Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, which also facilitated or made possible the use of this specific weapon. None of those conditions apply to the so-called Gaza envelope on October 7th uh, for all the reasons that were mentioned earlier, where this was, these were lightning raids. They were not expecting the Israeli military to take so long to come back. When the Israeli military came back, they used overwhelming firepower, including on their own civilians. That's another topic for another time, but we'll get into that too. And um, so I don't believe that this is a case where rape as a weapon of war has been introduced uh, along with it happening in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. I, I believe what we're seeing instead is a case of pro-genocide propaganda designed to manufacture consent against the entire Palestinian population and a and a rhetorical device designed to make an accusation so heinous that it makes thinking about um, negotiating with, envisioning a future uh, in which there's a political negotiation of these both parties, the Israeli state and Hamas, maybe coming to some kind of political negotiation, a prisoner swap, etc. It makes all of these things sound uh, morally inappropriate because how can you do this with rapists, right? Um, when the Rwanda-backed groups do this in the Eastern DRC, it's not Rwanda doing it. Rwanda says that it's this militia and every once in a while they arrest the leaders of the militia and the leaders of the militia are taken to Rwanda and taken to jail. They're made disposable. So um, Rwanda, when it uses this tactic, makes sure that it has a deniability. Um, when Israel accuses Hamas of using this weapon, 
they're trying to do the opposite. They're trying to say, this is Hamas, this everybody's Hamas, the Palestinians are Hamas, and this justifies everything we're doing. And it also justifies complete negation of any political position or um, any military uh, achievement that they might have because the accusation is so disgusting that you can't talk about anything else. So that's what I wanted to get into. I want to kind of clear that out of the way so that when we do analyze uh, Palestinian resistance um, tactics, strategies, uh, what the Israelis are doing, what the Palestinians are doing in future war videos, we don't have this hanging over us. We've kind of dealt with it. We've assessed the evidence. We've assessed um, the sources. We know what the actual use of this weapon has been in the past um, and what its consequences are and what it looks like. Um, and so we have some sense of how to match it uh, with what we're seeing here. Um, I will stop there and I will see you uh, in the next uh, in the next video. So um, best of luck in 2024 and we'll talk again soon.